Okay, so we've talked about uh, the amount of money that you make as a doctor in America. What about the quality of the training? So、mm. the spiel that、uh, we get sold in the UK is that UK training is higher quality than American training because, firstly, you are more of a generalist for longer. You're、mm. a core medical trainee for three years now into,、uh, with IMT.、Um, then you are a specialist registrar for like six, seven, sometimes even eight years.、Mm-hmm. Therefore, that gives you overall a far better training experience. Also, I was at the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists conference in Singapore、mm-hmm. two years ago. They had this big debate, like the stage debate about, you know, is obstetrics training better in America or better in the UK?、Mm-hmm. And overwhelming majority was like it's better in the UK, mostly because it's longer and that means you have more time to just get the stuff done. Yeah. And you'd rather have a doctor who's been doing the thing for nine years rather than one who's been doing it for three years and now earning four hundred k. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs>、yeah. What's the deal with quality of training? Yeah. So I think.、Um... It's a fair point. I don't think it's, it's it's an easy answer either way, and I think it really comes down to what you prioritize、mm. in the type of clinician, clinician you want to be or the type of clinician you want to be seen by. So what I will say is, there's no doubt that being、uh, having gone through the UK training system, and I'm going to use just dermatology as an example,、sure. but apply it as you will. If I'd gone to the, through the the training pathway as a dermatologist in the UK, what would have happened is I would have done my F1, F2, within which I would have probably rotated in like radiology and psychiatry and you know maybe A and E. Then F two, I would have done like you know obstetrics and gynecology and GI and you know geriatrics, for example. Then I would have done a further you know couple of years of core medical training uh, and uh, continue to rotate through like you know nephrology and internal medicine, all those kind of things. And ultimately, I would have begun specialty training in dermatology around four or five years after I graduated from medical school is、mm-hmm. when I would begin to do my dermatology training. The dermatology training itself would then be around about five years from like ST three to ST eight, say ish. Um, and then you're thinking about whether or not you want to do research or a PhD, and then get a consultant job. So it's a really long training pathway, and、uh, it's going to give you a bunch of different skills. So what I will say is, if you value the idea of being a really good generalist, and you know you want to have a, a well-rounded experience of a lot of different specialties, and that's something which just will make you feel more empowered. Like you know, oh, I, I know a little bit more about radiology, so you know I would have spent four months on that. Uh, then cool, I understand. You've definitely done more general training,、uh, being a, a doctor here in England. <laughs> What I always argue is just that how much of that is relevant to your long term next forty, fifty years career as a consultant, and I know it really does depend on your specialty.、Mm-hmm. So you know, maybe if you're doing internal medicine, are you going to be a better internal medicine doctor if you've gone through the UK versus three years there and immediately be very green, you know, young junior attending? Maybe because you can argue all of those experiences are relevant throughout your、uh, throughout your career.、Mm. As a dermatologist, I don't think radiology would have helped me much. I don't think obstetrics and gynecology would have helped me much. The kind of learning points that some people try and talk about to make themselves feel like this was a good use of time, they'll say, you know, oh no, but now I'm more comfortable with this one particular rash that happens in you know obstetrics because I did four months in obstetrics. And、I'll argue that that's not a, a good return on your <laughs> on your <laughs> time. time yeah. yeah, to spend four months to be that one type of rash, you know. So, all I'll say is, in the UK, yes, you get a really good general exposure to things. I don't think that's the motivation behind why we are structured the way we are in the UK.、Mm. I don't think it's because they want to, you know, really expose us to things that are going to be useful. In reality, they they want to use us when we're. Junior doctors because we're cheap, right? I mean, they they don't want us to become specialists in one particular area early on because then we will try to command the salary of a specialist and work in that area. Whereas it's better if we're in training because it kind of gives an excuse to pay us less than we're worth and <laughs> to keep us constantly moving and you know to keep the system afloat. Which again, which is what you have to do in a public healthcare system. So I understand it. I don't think their motivation is to make you a better ultimate specialist in whatever it is you want to do because. If you want to do radiology, then your GP experience was pointless. If you want to do dermatology or ophthalmology, then your experience in psychiatry was really not a good use of your time. So what I argue is that the way the system is set up in America, if you have a clear idea of what specialty you want to do, it's the most satisfying thing in the world because you finish medical school. And even though I did one year of general medicine before I started dermatology,、mm. because they want you to have some exposure to it, not go straight into one specialty.、Um, I feel like my one year was enough. In that one year, I have a good understanding of you know the acuity of certain medical situations. I can feel like I do have a, a grasp on common medical problems that aren't just skin specific,、mm. but I haven't had to do six years laboring through different rotations just to try and pretend like it's made me incrementally <laughs> more qualified、uh, specialist. So if you told me that you know 
our dermatologist in England has been trained for 10 years, so they must be better than you when you're trained for, you know, four years. Mm. I would say if they'd spent that 10 years doing dermatology, no questions asked. Yeah, I'm sure they probably just by value of the amount of cases they're exposed to, I'm sure they've had better training. But they haven't. I mean, <laughs> they've spent like one year of it being a secretary in as an F1. And they spent some surgery rotations, which are pointless. They spent radiology rotations, which are pointless. So um, I'm not convinced that that makes them a better dermatologist. And on the flip side, my the training that I've, I receive in America, I'm now in my um, second full year of training in dermatology. And I'd say the number of patients which I have seen primarily as my own patients with basically just the attending, you know, sticking their head in for 10 seconds and signing off on my plan mm. is close to maybe two to 3,000 patients that I've really? independently seen. Oh, wow. <laughs> so okay. that's because from my second year of postgraduate training, I was in the clinic and I was seeing my own patients and I was, you know, going through days, seeing 20 patients on yeah. my own, devising plans, seeing their rushes, really getting specialist training in my field. Mm. So if you were to compare case numbers, <laughs> like, you know, yeah. damn specific case numbers between two things, I would argue that, that the level of like focus training you get in America far exceeds the type of mishmash compilation that you've received um, in the more convoluted pathway that you have here in England. So really, again, it's what do you value? Do you value a generalist who, you know, focuses later on in life and probably doesn't see as many cases? Or do you prefer someone who's extremely optimized to one area? It's the American way that, you know, they believe in specialization, like Adam Smith, you know, economics. It's that everyone should be specialized in their mm. own sectors. So that's how they approach healthcare as well. You should be a specialist. I don't want to see someone who's a primary care doctor. That's why, you know, in America, if a GP tried to treat your rash for you, you'd just be like, just refer me to the dermatologist yeah, I mean, and I really appreciate your input, but just send me to the specialist. Yeah. Because that's the way they see things. It's like, I don't want someone who's a generalist. Whereas here it'd be like, well, no, obviously I'm not going to send you to do dermatology for that. We've got clear guidelines as to who exactly. I'm going to refer to dermatology. Exactly. There is no way you're going. Exactly. <laughs> this is a GP problem. It's a culture thing, <laughs> yeah. right? It's a culture thing. Here it's like, oh, general knowledge and don't send a specialist. Over there it's like, if I have a headache, I'm thinking my neurologist, not you. How do you yeah. know? About that? <laughs> that's just the about way. Attention headache. <laughs> so whether yeah. or not that, again, that's not good for the expenditure of the healthcare system, but that's just the way people's mentality is over there. And likewise, their training is: if you want to do dumb, do dumb. <laughs> Don't yeah. do other things. Become really good at that. And then, what I argue is the type of uh, teaching you get in in a residency program in America is head and shoulders above what you receive okay. in the How UK. So. so um, I touch upon this a little bit in the day in the life that I do in another mm. part of the course, but um, just off the top of my head, in a regular like Monday to Friday uh, week uh, rotation uh, in medicine, take internal medicine, you will have 10 hours of structured academic time built into your regular day schedule. Like 10 hours in a week? In one week, of, from Monday to Friday. Like protected teaching time? Of protected teaching Where time. someone is actively teaching you? Yeah, where in the morning, we have an hour in the morning where we have uh, uh, like a case... Uh, 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 case report like in the morning where it's kind of a case-based discussion someone will come and be like oh it's a, a real case that they've had in the hospital i say last week there was six year male came in with uh, syncope what do you guys want to know and and the oh, program yeah. director and the chairman will be in the room with you sitting yeah. there each morning or like you know one of one or two or senior staff will be there in the room who are affiliated with the program will be there sitting with you guys encouraging you mentoring you telling you how to approach these cases so it'll be an hour of that case-based discussion of you and the, your co-residents discussing some of these interesting cases. That's really fun. <laughs> it's brilliant. Yeah, I love it. And you have free coffee there, bagels. You sit down, have your coffee. You have those case-based discussions and you take your learning points away from that and it's a really good use of your time. Wait, is, that, and, and is that every morning? Every morning. Every yeah. morning. The every program morning. director is like there with you chilling. Yeah. Either the PD or the associate program director, like yeah. it won't just be one of the random attendees who's free. It's like this is part of their job as yeah. the program directors is they are part of your teaching curriculum. They're so like there. first thing in the morning, you actually hang out with all your mates who are oh, also yeah. residents in well, dermatology and together, uh, yeah. just working through a case. Yeah, you get oh. together, sit together. Yeah. So uh, in medicine, it would be like that. And especially when you're an intern, your resident who's your senior is supposed to take your pager from you as you enter that room in the morning so that no one can bother you. So for that hour, you are there to learn, to learn how to approach a case, no matter what's going on, that's your protected teaching time. That's in the morning. So then you have a noon conference, which um, typically begins at you know, 12 o'clock, and that's another uh, section of protected time. Um, and at that point, it's lecture-based, not case-based. So what you'll do is, what they do is they get um, a person who's kind of responsible for a type of inpatient care to give a um, relevant talk to just your, your experience as being uh, in the inpatient medical team. So just ones off the top of my head, they had attendings in geriatrics who would come in and give a talk about how to make sure that you your geriatric patients, when they get admitted to the hospital, they don't end up like atrophying a lot of their muscle and losing their mobility and, yeah. you know, tips and tricks for that. Or uh, there'll be an endocrinologist who'll come in and give you a talk about 
patients with DKA and the best way to manage that whole process. So it's just great because you sit there and there's like relevant content tailored specifically to this demographic given by people who are experts in their own fields. And they come and give you that lecture from 12 o'clock to one o'clock. You have your lunch at, uh, there. While I was, the place where I was in tenure, they gave us um, credit on like a website like Just Eat where we would just order our lunches to that location at 12 o'clock. We'd turn up, we'd have protected time for an hour with our hot lunch there ready for us to, to eat and we would get another hour of teaching. So imagine that. I mean, imagine if twice a day, you know, you're getting an hour of teaching. Each week you're getting 10 hours of dedicated teaching time specific to you. I would argue that makes you a better qualified, you know, uh, clinician in the end because you have so much structured teaching time. Whereas um, in the UK, I'm sure you could probably speak this better than I can, but from my experience, there'd be like maybe one hour a week and that one hour would just be like one grand rounds where sometimes the speaker doesn't turn up or like there's like 10 people and people kind of quibble amongst themselves about one little minute detail and you just feel like it's all gone over your head and mm. you don't really gain much from it. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, that's kind of just what my experience was. Okay, yeah, so, I, so I think for me, the one hour a week teaching has been good, but mm. it has only been an hour a week. Yeah. And if there was yeah. 10 hours a week, even if half of those are not very good, like that's still a large amount of teaching. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I think that was, was a big difference for me that I noticed. And that's one of the reasons why I think the quality of training there was is, is particularly high. In dermatology, especially when, when uh, my, our grand rounds, which are, you know, every Thursday morning, we have uh, four hours of teaching um, mm. uh, on Thursdays. That's like the structure of my program. Four hours. Four hours on every Thursday morning. So from like 8 a.m. to 12 o'clock, it's just straight teaching. And um, we have speakers who have flown in from different parts of the country. No. Yeah. <laughs> speakers have flown in from different parts of the country because they are specialists in different conditions. Flown in to speak to us specifically to lecture the Mount Sinai residents on a topic. So you have a guy who's an expert in different types of radiation therapy specific to dermatology. A guy who's an expert in Mohs micrographic surgery from San Diego. And um, it's part of the culture is, you know, people become guest speakers and they, they fly around, they do the circuit, and uh, they just give you this incredible insight into like these clinical pearls that you're just not gonna get from, you know, just reading it in a textbook mm. or just walking around. Um, so it's just amazing. Like I, I sit there feeling like I have to pinch myself because I'm like, I go in in the morning on Thursdays and they have flown this guy in from, you know, wherever they flown him in from Florida to teach me about like this new imaging modality and, you know, optical coherence tomography and its uses and confocal microscopy and its uses in dermatology. I haven't had to go anywhere. It's like having a conference like dropped at your door yeah. each week. So um, I would argue that going through that kind of a process and getting, you know, specific up to date, like rock star speakers being delivered to you, you know, is that going to outdo having had an extra four or five years of rotating through different <laughs> specialties? I think so, but yeah. who knows? I mean, there's no way of empirically proving it. I completely respect those people who are um, registered dermatologists here in the UK, of course. Um, I just don't feel like I've been shortchanged at all by my training okay. in the and, US. Uh, so you, you were saying at some point earlier, I think when we were having lunch about uh -huh. this idea of uh, the UK being quite service provision heavy when you're a resident versus the US being quite teaching specific like can you talk a little bit about that yeah so i mean i feel like again it, it, it's always going back to that private versus public healthcare system uh problem where a lot of the the burden on kind of keeping the system in the nhs afloat is the fact that you have these low paid but very skilled workers in the nhs which are the junior doctors um who are responsible for basically just keeping everything going like manning 30 patients each if they need to because that's how many patients are in the hospital and that's mm. how many people need care and and that's because the, the staff's uh, supply is so short here comparatively and you're so overstretched. I feel like a lot of your day to day is spent on literally just forget me and my development right now. Like I need to focus on making sure this guy's alive and this person's stable, which completely makes sense. In the US, they have the luxury and I guess the, the money to be able to um, have better, safer staffing levels. So as I mentioned, there's those caps on the teams, right? So as an intern, if you only have 10 patients, that gives you so much more time to read up about each one of those patients and give them the gold standard of care because you know their case inside out and mm. you know everything that's the the, the most evidence-based interventions for them. So um, the way they make that happen is in a regular team, uh, in a regular hospital, when a patient is coming through the emergency room and they've decided that they have to be admitted to the hospital, there's two options which they can pursue. They can either admit the patient to what's called a teaching team, which is where the residents are. So there's, you know, the attending the resident and two interns, that's one teaching team. Or they can admit the patient to a non-teaching team, which is just an attending with some nurse practitioners or physician's assistants. Their job is service provision. So their job is to take the 
three delirious or you know the elderly patients with UTIs or the run of the mill mm. pneumonia who were just monitoring for 24 hours those patients will go to them because it's considered that there's not that much you guys will be able to learn from this as residents so we're going to give that patient to the non teaching team uh, and instead we're going to prioritize giving you guys patients that have better teaching value so imagine that imagine if every patient that was coming onto your service had been like curated yeah. <laughs> for you for learning opportunities how much more a kind of a high yield training program would you have experienced if that if that's what it was like for you here in England and once again it's no critique of it that's how the system has to be in order for it to be viable here but um there are just some pros of having the private system over there in the US for this type of reason okay so it sounds like overall you would say that you've not been shortchanged by the american training system if anything you think that the quality of training per unit time is significantly higher in the american system whereas i suppose the uk guys would say okay fair enough in a public system we need more time and I, maybe they would argue they'd have a similar quality of training just yeah. in no extended period of time. And they'd probably yeah. argue that, oh, well, you know, I kind of liked having a bit of nephrology, a bit of respiratory, a bit of cardiology, mm -hmm. even though I wanted to become a radiologist. Yeah, absolutely. And it would definitely give you a broader, uh, you know, exposure to things throughout your training. Um, and but this, the only thing I will say is just, uh, even if you're, if you're a surgeon, especially, that's, that's one thing which people especially do like to point out. Is that yeah, that's surely if, if you'd have more practice over a 10 year period then. So, but, but what you have to appreciate is that when you're in surgery residency in the US, even in your first year of surgery residency, you are actually in the OR. You're, oh, actually, right. <laughs> you're actually the secondary surgeon almost immediately when you're in surgery residency, depending on which rotation you're on. In England, when you're on a surgery rotation in F1, you're on a medicine rotation because you're basically in charge of every medical problem on the floor mm. while the rest of the team is actually in the OR doing surgery. Similarly, if you're like an F2 on surgery, you're not doing the surgery. If you're a registrar, still, you're probably not doing the surgery. Maybe if you're like an ST3, you'll be promoted to like camera holder. And that'll be like a big move for you is when you're responsible for the camera, things like that. Otherwise, you're doing a lot of retraction. You're not in the primary surgical position for a very long time. In the US, people in their first year will be in the primary surgical position with supervision uh, in their residency training. So yeah, it's shorter. And you might, as a reflex, think, oh my God, this guy's only had three years of surgery training. I want this guy who's got a gray beard and you know he's old. Um, but just think about what that experience is and how quickly they have been in the actual surgical positions. And I think that is something which, um, if you do an elective and you see it firsthand, I think that's when you appreciate a lot more. Okay. So, so the thing that this is reminding me of is um, I do a lot of stuff, like stuff around like evidence-based study tips. Mm -hmm. And it's all about kind of really focusing down on the thing, the thing that you're weakest on, yeah. actively working on it, and then kind of spaced repetition over a long period of time to, mm -hmm. to get better at the thing. Whereas the default way is oh, I'm just sort of going to read the textbook and I'll sort of get a general idea of everything, but yeah. it's not focused to any specific thing. Yeah, I, It seems like that's sort of the difference between US, which is very focused on teaching versus the UK, which is a bit more generally just hang around, do your, own, do your own thing, and every now and then you'll get some experience. I think, I think that's a pretty fair comparison. And I mean, again, there'll always be that suspicion of me being biased because that's mm. what I've experienced right now. But what I'm saying is just going by the numbers alone, if you looked at the number of shave biopsies or punch biopsies or laser procedures or cosmetic procedures or excisions that I've done and the number of just complicated psoriasis patients or bullous pemphigoid patients or you know Stevens Johnson or TEN patients I've seen at this stage in my training I don't know that you'll find a, a doctor unless they're you know maybe ST6 or 7 that will have comparable case numbers Okay. Um, so that's what I'll say. And I think there was one more thing about about the teaching thing, whereby I think I think you said earlier that the um, they they're much more invested in you as uh, yeah. you, you know as as a, a doctor in yeah. the US versus in the UK. Yeah. What, what do you mean by that? So that that was another thing which which I found really striking and one of like the biggest advantages I think of the entire application process in the US. Um, here in the UK, I know because I did the application myself for, for F one. Um, you know, it's basically it's an anonymized, centralized process where you combine all your numbers and your SJT scores and they just put you in a machine and just spit you out somewhere into the country. Um, the place where you end up starting your F1 job, they don't know you. They haven't selected you. It's not like, you know, the leadership in that department have been like, this is Ali Abdal, the man that we picked from the pile and, you know, that we really want to focus on, on training right now. And likewise, they know that within four months, you're then off somewhere else. And within a year or two you're almost definitely off to another hospital to do your core medical training surgical training gp etc even in your core surgical training you still rotate around it in four month you know uh, uh, allotments so what that means is um and you can probably speak to this more than i can i i can just speculate and from what i saw in medical school is that it's so variable who you end up with on a team is just 
potluck, whether you end up with a consultant who really wants to take the time for some reason to invest in you and teach in you, or whether you're with a consultant who just wants you to do the job, get things done so that, you know, there's no task left behind and just go home at the end of the day and just, you know, repeat until mm. your, your time is done. In the UK, you're really relying on people's goodwill and like um, just luck that you will end up having had some of those mentors that will invest in you, um, knowing that you're not going to stick around for them, chances are. In the US, these the, the chairman of, of, of the uh, departments, the program directors, the associate program directors, they have picked your application up. They have read your personal ta- statement. They've seen you on the interview day. They talk to you. They know your name on interview day. And they will spend that entire day trying to persuade you why it's a good idea for you to come train with them, trying to sell themselves to you, basically, oh. telling you <laughs> or telling you why it would be so great for you to come to that program. Yeah. Then if you guys end up ranking each other and you match together and you start training, they know who you are. They know that you're going to be with them in that hospital yeah. for the length of your training. You're not being sent off to a district hospital somewhere else. Yeah. You know, you're going to be with them. And chances are, by the end of that, you're going to be either a colleague of theirs and maybe you end up working in that same facility or you're going to be part of like the general community and someone who they have known for a continued period of three, four years. And they take pride in the fact that this is a career that they nurtured and helped to grow because they're invested in you because they picked you and they've so, trained you. So, so it's sort of like uh, Oxbridge Colleges, whereby rather mm-hmm. than being one of 300, you're one of 10. Exactly. And they've actively spoken to you and chatted to yeah. you. And, yeah. <laughs> and you. Then yeah. the connection you guys have with, yeah. with your tutors is infinitely different to the yeah. one that the lecturer has with the room full of 400 people that he's yeah. just talking at, right? So it's very similar in that way where they are just so invested in seeing you succeed and they'll be talking to you throughout the year. They'll be your research mentors. They'll be your clinical mentors. And you can just go to those people for advice. Um, and that's what they're there for. They see that as a function of their job, mm. not just, you know, oh, I'm a consultant here in medicine. I've been given this F1 and all right, good. All right, yeah, have any issues, right, I'm going to type up my supervisor's report. Any problems? Yeah. No, good. Right. <laughs> Occasionally, I'll tell you yeah. to read this article I've seen in yeah. the journal. That'll be my teaching done. Like, yeah. you know, have you read the New England Journal? Okay, read that by tomorrow. We'll discuss. And that's it. And they'll forget about it tomorrow and you will never discuss. So I just think that, like, that personal investment they have in you, it really resonates throughout your entire training program. And you just get that sense that these people care about whether or not I am developing as a clinician. And I just haven't seen that in a consistent way here in England because of how kind of uh, disparate and how kind of disjointed uh, okay. the system is here. Yeah, I feel like that's much uh, like if it like to, to the extent that it is a thing in England, it's much more at the registrar level whereby mm, you yeah. have actually interacted with people physically. Yeah. And your program director is like your consultant and therefore investing yeah. in your thing. And I found like especially on like my cardiology job, like mm-hmm. my first job of F1. It seemed like the training that the registrars got was fantastic because yeah. they were like fully plugged into the system mm, and it was yeah. all like sort of bespoke for them. And like, you know, this guy's interested in scanning, this guy's interested in uh, yeah. in like procedures, angiograms, whatever. Mm-hmm. That would be specifically tailored to them. Yeah. And it sounds like you're saying that's kind of across the board in residence in America rather yeah. than sort of a, if you get lucky with the right right training program in the UK. I think that makes a lot of sense, right? Because then when it comes to the registrar level, that's when in England they actually do interviews and they actually take the yeah. time to get to know you a little bit more personally. And that's when they might think this guy could be a consultant with us in the future. So it makes a lot of sense that you would feel that more personal relationship at a registrar yeah, level. And I've do. never seen that. But I guess you I don't feel it as junior. F1, F2 or a Exactly, yeah. Training, and I think so. for me, because I'd only ever seen the more junior levels because that was what was immediately in front of me, I didn't see that. So when I saw it in the US from the well, beginning, I was like, cool. oh, wow, I feel so special. Like, you know, <laughs> they know who I am. And uh, the one other thing, so so I did one of my um, electives was actually in orthopedic surgery as well at the uh, Hospital for Special Surgery in New York back when I thought maybe I might want to do orthopedic surgery. And uh, I just remember this one moment <laughs> which... Uh, it really kind of highlighted to me more than anything the fact that you are surrounded by the cutting edge and like world leaders when you're working in some of these institutions in the US. We were sitting there in one of these like journal club equivalent things while I was on my rotation. And they were talking about this article that was published in like one of the most prestigious journals in orthopedic surgery. It was like this seminal paper about this type of technique they used for this like repair of, you know, one of the um, menisci in the knee or something like that. And as they were discussing it, they were like, oh, I think what the author meant was this, what the author meant was this. And, And the guy was like, oh, why don't you just ask him? He's actually sitting behind you on a couple of rows up from yeah. them. And they turned around and they were like, oh, Dr. Blah, Blah, like, what do you mean? And he was like, oh, what I meant? And he just, the, the author of this publication that was like such a seminal piece in this new technique happened to be like behind the person who was presenting this like, you know, piece of research. And um, th- I think that's just an example of how like the the being around those people who are at the cutting edge of developing new techniques and new medications and pioneering research you don't often get that when you're in the NHS. Um, and and I'm, always, I'm talking about my own dermatology examples as well, but just similar, I noted similar things when um, considering new medications like biologics. So at Mount Sinai, we have a person who 
pioneered the first biologic treatment for eczema, which is called dupilumab. And she literally did the trials for it. She was in the New York Times for it. And that's my attending who I work with in clinic, who I can ask about okay. this medication. So so that's all wearing good. But mm-hmm. you're in a fancy ass hospital in the middle yep. of New York City. Like, yeah. surely that's not the experience that some randomer in some random yeah. village in Texas is going to have. No, I'm sure, exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm so. sure it's, it's not to say that yeah, every hospital has world leaders in there. Of yeah. course not. I just think that, like, even if you were in, you know, um, that, like, you don't see many elite institutions. So even St. Mary's Hospital, where I did some of my training at Imperial College London, mm-hmm. you don't often see that the, the seminal clinical trial for a new medication was done in a hospital in the NHS. Mm-hmm. And that's, no, that's not a critique of it. It's just, again, most of the pharma companies are based in the U.S. and most of the partnerships they have are with okay, the institutions yeah. there. So they always do those trials much earlier in those settings, which just means that you have access, you just very much feel like I am on the cutting edge. Mm. If there is something to know about in this field, these people around me know about it because yeah. this is where it happens and then this is where everyone else learns about it. Okay, cool. So overall, we've talked a lot about kind of the training differences. It sounds like the vast majority of them are a function of the private versus public yes. healthcare. And we're not like bashing the UK or no, saying, you know, you know, it's just, it, the system is what it has to be to survive. Exactly. Um, but that means that our training is a secondary rather than where, whereas, you know, patient safety is primary. Yeah, service provision <laughs> service is the priority because you have to keep it updated. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Cool.